Hello everyone and welcome to another ASAS Partner Webcast. My name is Maureen McInerney, Partner Marketing Specialist here at ASAS, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for this presentation. Today's webcast is being recorded. The link to the recording and the accompanying slides will be posted to the ASAC website calendar of events and all registrants will receive a follow-up email with the link to those materials once the webcast has concluded. I'd like to remind our audience members that you can submit your questions at any time by clicking the purple Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Today's webcast is Migration Options for New GL on S4 HANA, sponsored by ERP Fixers. Our speaker today is Paul from ERP Fixers, and with that, I'll hand it over to him to get us started. Thanks, Maureen, and thanks everyone for enjoy, uh, joining this webcast. Um, I'm going to take you through just a couple of introductory slides about um, my company, ERP Fixers, and myself, and then we'll get into the, the presentation. So ERP Fixers is a platform uh, we started three years ago. Um, it's more like a, um, a consulting platform with thousands of consultants that specialize in several modules. Normally, we deal with short-term projects and requests, um, either online or um, depending on the project, it could be on site. We do things like optimizations. If you have uh, module in SAP that um, you just you don't necessarily have an issue, but you just want to see if you're utilizing the module in the most optimal way. We have that. We do material ledger services, and I'm I, one of my main specialties is material ledger in addition to the other FICO modules. So we have that as a specialization. Um, we help out with uh, S4HANA transitional roadmap, so uh, which may not necessarily involve implementing S4HANA, but is more, okay, where are you right now? You know, what functionality do you have right now? How do you, you know, based on what you know about the s HANA functionality, or if we educate you on that, what does that mean in terms of time, in terms of uh, changes to what you have in your current system, in terms of opportunities you can leverage in S4, what does that mean? So we, we do that as well. And then we have a few uh, customized reports which help out with uh, predominantly inventory costs, but some other other aspects of SAP. Uh, I think I missed the slide. So my bio, I've worked as an ERP financials consultant uh, since 97, and I specialize predominantly in FI and CO modules along with their integrated areas. Um, there are three books I've written on financial accounting, COPA, and material ledger. So, so the fir first slide is on the functionalities of new GL. Now, this, this presentation is about the migration options of new GL and s hana But if you're listening to this presentation, I think you, you may not, it's very likely you don't have new GL yet. You know, even though new GL has been around since the, you know, 15 years probably, but I know some companies just based on conflicting projects or other things are not yet a new GL. And HANA is around the corner because, you know, that's where everyone is eventually going to move. And this session is basically about, okay, what do you do to, um, to what considerations need to be made about the migration? Uh, what is the functionality that you need to take advantage of? Because depending on what functionality you want to take advantage of, that could impact your migration path. So, and just by the way, to connect this back to something I said earlier, this session came out of a, a real life um, project we had trying to help a client with optimizing um, their transitional path to s hana So it could also be useful even if you don't, um, you're not going to s hana for a few years. So the functionalities of new GL, um, some of this is pretty canned SAP functionality, but it's the, the extensibility, legal and management reporting, real-time integration, segment reporting, transparency, um, increase in ROI, 
simple mapping of parallel valuation and account balancing and any characteristics. Just to break out the few important points there. Uh, and this is on the left, the right hand part of the slide. The business requirement, if you want different financial statements for different gap purposes, New GL had what's called multiple ledgers or parallel ledgers. If you want unified management and legal reporting, so more often now you don't have the demarcation between legal versus management reporting. It's all just reporting and you slice and dice what you want. So now the profit center is now part of the general ledger. If you're not on New GL, your profit center resides in like the CEO module or the enterprise controlling module, but a new GL is part of the general ledger. Segment reporting as per US GAAP. So years ago, the US uh, SEC and also the International Accounting Standards Board came out with the need for segment reporting for certain types of companies. So SAP introduced a new field called the segment. Then financial statement below the company code level, predominantly SAP, the financial statement is fully balanced at a company code level. Any other dim dimension, you could get some, some entries, but not a complete set of books. But with document splitting functionality in new GL, you can get a complete set of books for a dimension that's not a company code. Okay, so in addition to the company code, you could have other dimensions that have a full set of financial statements. And then if you want to report based on cost of sales accounting. So cost of sales accounting um, is almost a different methodology of reporting your P&L that's not basically based on periodic or accrual based data. It's really all tied to cost of sales. You know, just to give you an example, costing based COP is a cost of sales type of uh, P&L. But if you wanted something in general ledger, there's functional area functionality, which um, which is something that uh, that is, can be used. Okay, so moving on to parallel ledgers in S4 HANA. So NewGL features parallel ledger, which is one of the key features of NewGL. This means that several ledgers can be used in parallel. Each ledger can be used for the production of financial statements based on different accounting principles, right? So the data can be posted to all ledgers or specific ledgers. Now this is functionality that not, all, not every company needs. It's normally for larger companies that have different entities in different zones. Um, and it is one of those things that um, if you have local reporting in certain countries or certain regions, but the rules are different from the reporting of the parent company, you can get the best of both worlds by having two different ledgers, right? So selective, you can post to all ledgers, or you can have selective posting to the local ledgers, which comply with their accounting standards. And if you have that, then you have separate retained earnings accounts for these multiple ledgers. So what I said in the previous slide applies to parallel ledgers in new GL, whether you're an ECT or you're an S4. In S4, this is somewhat enhanced because you have this massive table called ACDOC-A or the Universal Journal. And so parallel gap reporting is in this single table. You have multiple ledgers, depending on different business requirements. All the data from all your other modules, like asset accounting, general ledger, APL, material ledger, all come, even COPA, come into the same table. That's the difference between new GL and s HANA, new GL in, um, in, in ECC. The new GL and the ECC, it does have excellent functionality, but it's still somewhat isolated from some of the other modules, like um, the controlling module or like material ledger. Um, but in S4, it, the ledger is a key field in the Universal Journal, table ACDOC A. So there's several functionalities that blend the ledger, the different parallel ledgers with all the other modules that feed into ACDOC A. 
Okay. And the, the reporting is more flexible because you, you're really slicing and dicing just one table. Right, so I have a couple of examples of parallel ledger postings. That's for, for again, I'm assuming that, you know, if you don't have new GL, you don't know what parallel ledger is, um, unless you use something called special purpose ledger, which I think is being, being phased out now. Um, so what happens with parallel ledger is if you make a normal posting, right, and you don't specify a ledger group, that is what you see over here. If you don't specify a ledger group, then that posting goes to every ledger, right? So you have no ledger group, so it goes to ledger 0L and ledger 2L, right? Same exact um, document um, and same document number. Now, if you do specify a ledger group and you make the posting, you say, oh, I want 0L or I want 1L, then those postings are exclusive to the ledger. So 0L goes to the 0L, 1L goes to 1L. I mean, having said that, I just realized that if, if, if the ledger you post to is the leading ledger, and that's something else, I wouldn't get into uh, so much detail with that, but if it's the leading ledger in your SAP system, then it will go to all the ledgers, right? But if it's a non-leading ledger, then it's exclusive to that ledger. So for example, if you have um, a company that has uh, uh, US GAAP and IFRS, right? And the adjustments you want to make a month end or at some certain points during the month are IFRS adjustments, then US GAAP would be your leading ledger. So anytime you post to the leading ledger, it goes to both US GAAP and IFRS. Then at month end or at a certain point in the month, you say, okay, I have a material valuation or depreciation adjustments to make you make it only to the IFRS ledger. And that's how you get your differentiation between one gap accounting uh, posting and another. Another thing that was the, broad, the difference between S4 HANA and ECC is what's called extension ledger. So I explained that parallel ledger is just basically having um, two different ledgers for two different gap reporting purposes. Now you can also have what's called an extension ledger, which is more flexible than the parallel ledger, right? So what is the extension ledger? So it's for specific management adjustments or realignment adjustments, right? So if you look at the bottom right of this uh, slide, you post regular journals and which serve various applications, um, and your normal postings during the month go through. Those will go to your standard ledger, base ledger. You can even call it your leading ledger if you want, right? That's just the regular postings. Then on top of that, on top of these, you could have manual postings that you don't want to affect your base ledger, which go to this extension ledger, right? So these are specific management adjustments or realignment adjustments, okay? Now, in fact, before I move on to the next slide, um, a question I get asked, and I'm sure some of you are asking is, what's the difference? You know, you just explained parallel ledger, you know, where one posting goes to multiple ledgers and you can do adjustments. Now you said extension ledger, and it seems pretty similar. There is a difference, and I explain that difference further later, but there is a difference. The extension ledger one is much more flexible. Secondly, the posting, the base posting that you make to the ledger the leading ledger doesn't go to the extension ledger as well. It only goes to the leading ledger. It, the extension ledger almost like piggybacking off the leading ledger and say, I'm going to take everything you've got and I'm going to add my own stuff. The parallel ledger, when you post to the leading ledger, it goes to the leading ledger and the parallel ledger. The extension ledger, it only goes to the leading ledger. The, the beauty about extension ledger is when you're reporting on an extension ledger, you report on both the extension ledger adjustments and whatever base ledger you have defined in configuration that that extension ledger should piggyback off. So it's pretty flexible. I mean, one easy advantage you can see is that from a data resources standpoint, you don't have the same posting in two ledgers, right? So with the extension ledger, you still have this, um, um, a, a lot of uh, different organizations decide whether to use the ledger approach or the accounts approach. So the ledger approach being 
um, that you have two different ledgers rep representing your different gaps. The accounts approach means you have accounts that represents your different gaps. So instead of um, having a totally different ledger, you have just one ledger and you have a group of accounts which represents the different gap, right? So adjustment accounts. And that was more used, um, it, it, predominantly used maybe 10 years ago and, and earlier. Now people use, companies use the um, ledger approach more, but extension ledgers work with, with either. So these extension ledgers store delta values pointing to um, another ledger for adjustments and reporting. Um, so it's more for management reporting because with an extension ledger, you're assuming that it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily want to recreate um, a, a, a different accounting method. You just want to do like uh, management reporting layers on top of legal reporting. It needs minor configuration. It can have its own posting period variant, so it's not restricted by the posting period variant of the leading ledger. Um, when you report on it, as I mentioned, it also includes the data of the base ledger. You can have multiple extension ledgers, so you can have different extension ledgers on the same base ledger that are for different purposes, you know? So like, a, you know, I have this management scenario that I want to see one way, I have another management scenario I want to see a different way, but the base ledger is still the same. And of course, it reduces the data footprint because there's less data in the system, unlike the parallel ledger where you're basically duplicating the base ledger and then adding the top of it. And then also reconciliation standpoint, it's really, it's taking exactly what's in the base ledger when you report. So it's not, it, there shouldn't be any reconciliation issues. Okay, and in the universal journal, an extension ledger looks just like a normal ledger. So how does it show up? So let's look at a simple um, uh, screen, FAGL L03, the transaction for this, the GL accounting view. Um, if you see the line items of the base ledger, you see these one, two, three, four, five line items of the base ledger, right? You're, you're viewing the base ledger. When you view the extension ledger, even though it's only one line you've added to the extension ledger, which is the, the sixth line here, wait, if you report by the extension ledger, it's going to show you everything in the base ledger in addition to the extra line for the extension ledger. Okay, then there's also something called simulation ledger that I'll just touch on briefly. And this is more, it's, it's really an extension ledger but really more for simulations and uh, uh, for, to, to predict, to do forecasts or predictions on your ledger. Um, this is, for example, you could have a simulation ledger to analyze the implication of different exchange rates on different currencies, right? And when you do that, you can make a posting using your normal foreign exchange um, transaction at month end. Uh, when you make the posting, it it shows you what would happen in the simulation ledger if the exchange rate was one way versus the other. And you can post it and delete it as many times you like before you actually do the real posting. And once the real posting is done, then the simulation ledgers get deleted. So think of simulation ledgers um, even more flexible. So think of it as, you know, the parallel ledger is somewhat flexible. The extension ledger is more flexible than the parallel ledger. It's normally for management reporting. Simulation ledger is even more flexible than um, the extension ledger, and all these are set up when you're configuring your um, universal journal ledgers. Okay, so parallel ledger was one big thing in UGL and S4. The second thing is document splitting in S4. Now document splitting, um, again, it's, it's something that has been around for um, maybe 15 years, um, and but it's available in UGL whether you have HANA or not. Okay, so you can have ECC and document splitting as well. Document splitting assigns selected characteristics to all the line items in a financial document. It could include business errors, functional errors, profit centers, or a combination of these. Zero balancing documents facilitated the delivery of financial statements below the company code level. This is what I was saying when I said that even now, if you don't have new GL, you probably can still get some postings by profit center or business area to the balance sheet 
but they won't balance. So this feature called zero balancing in document splitting allows that. Um, document splitting can be used to determine missing account assignments, can help you create balance sheets for entities that extend beyond the, cult, the scope of company code, like segments or profit centers. And document creation and accounting interface are the two things that document splitting information is built on. So basically document splitting, it's really not for everybody. I, I would not recommend you to implement document splitting if there's not a need for it. Document splitting is really, one, it's, first of all, it's, it's more a balance sheet thing than an income statement thing. It's really, do you want to see your balance sheet balance on a level that's below your company code? Now, more, more and more, this is becoming a requirement because from a reporting standpoint, you know, there's more information you can, you can drill down into the better, you know, so not just, I don't just want to see my balance sheet by company code, I want to see by one dimension or another, but by region or by profit center or segment. So it's becoming more and more uh, commonplace, but it, it definitely is not for every company. So an overview of document splitting, it was introduced in ECC, it's also available in HANA. And again, you can get a financial statement on a profit center or other field level. It enables a complex display of documents, right? So we, instead of seeing two lines, which you will see, probably see right now, if that document is split, you could see uh, many more. Like, uh, so, sorry, instead of seeing three lines, you could see seven or eight, because each line may represent a different process center which needs to be balanced, and I'll show that later. So there is, um, in order to have documents, we need definitely new GL under three types, passive, active, and zero balancing. So I'll just go through those three. So what is active splitting? A active splitting is when you split the document when the document is posted, depending on the lines that were posted in the original document. So here's an example. On the left-hand side, I have um, a balance sheet item which is offset by two PL items with different profit centers. So because we want the balance sheet line to balance, the balance sheet line is proportionally split the same way the income statement lines are split. So basically you can see those profit centers on the balance sheet line or the income statement line, and that's how the balance sheet can balance for that characteristic. So the next type of document splitting is passive splitting. Now passive splitting is just an extension of active splitting. So for example, in the, in the document we had before this slide, you had active splitting of a balance sheet line into two PL, according to the profit center representation of the two PL lines. Now, if that balance sheet line was um, um, accounts, uh, say it was accounts payable, and now you've paid the vendor. So you credit the bank account, you debit the accounts payable account. But since the system knows that that accounts payable line was split with active splitting, it will also split the payment the same way by the same proportion that it split the, the active splitting was done. So instead of two lines, you have one, two, three, you have seven lines because the bank account is, um, is posted and, but the supplier, the vendor part of the document is split into the two lines that were split in active splitting, okay? So sp passive splitting is piggybacking off active splitting. If there's no active splitting, there's no passive splitting, okay? In fact, there's minimal con configuration done for passive splitting, it's just, as long as your general ledger accounts and document types are, are configured for document splitting, which they're done anyway in active splitting, passive splitting happens. So as the name, I know sometimes in SAP, the name of things do not necessarily represent what they do, but this is one case where it does. So it's passive. It doesn't really do anything on top of the, other than what the, um, the active splitting does. It just uses that data to do, um, do its split. Zero balancing is the third type of document split. So with zero balancing, it's not guaranteed when you do passive or active splitting that all the documents that 
balance to zero. Because if you want a profit center to be fully balanced in the balance sheet, it means for every document that's posted, if you subtotal by profit center, all the profit centers will come to zero. But if you saw with the previous um, slide, the bank, state, bank account posting had a different profit center from the actively split profit centers. So in order to balance all those um, lines so that the profit center is zero, the system, sorry, the system posts four new lines so that every profit center that was posted has an offset and it's posted to what's called a zero balance clearing account. So again, the idea is that when you have document splitting, active, passive, and zero balancing, if you subtotal every document by a profit center, it comes to zero. Therefore, if you do a balance sheet, um, if you report in a balance sheet by any of those profit centers, it will, will come to zero. So that is the strength of, um, of document splitting in, in, in uh, new GL. So what I, what I took you through in the last um, 20 minutes was basically the two key functionalities of new GL, document splitting and parallel ledger. Um, and also with document splitting, there's not so much of a difference in S4. It's really much, it's the same powerful functionality in ECC has been brought over to S4. Um, with parallel ledger, you have a few, few different a few extras in S4, like um, the simulation and extension ledgers. So now we'll go on to what are the options for new GL activation on the S4 Honda adoption path. So this is where, okay, your organization is like, okay, we understand what the functionality is. Okay, how do we get there? What are our options? So I have three options here. You know, there may be others, but these are three kind of common ways to transition from ECC to S4 if you don't have new GL. Option one, you have ECC, and by the way, um, I do get uh, asked this question sometimes, what is um, ECC? ECC is just basically the your SAP system, your standard SAP system, the blue and yellow screen or blue and gray screen that's ECC, which is different from S4 HANA, which is um, a, a totally different uh, suite of applications on the S4 on a HANA database. Okay, so ECC stands for Enterprise Central Component, really. and um, it, it just basically means that the system you use day to day in SAP. So option one, ECC is a classic GL. So you're on ECC right now, you don't have new GL, which surprises me, but a lot of companies still are in this uh, scenario. So option one is you first go on suite on HANA. So that's just another um, um, abbreviation I need, maybe not everybody knows. Suite on HANA just means you still have your ECC system, but your database is HANA, right? So that means that all, none of your functionality changes, but it just runs faster. That's it. Okay. So the option one is your ECC Classic GL. You go to suite on HANA, so you, you, you change your database to HANA. You don't do a new GL migration, but then you switch to S4 HANA. Now, what's different between suite on HANA and S4 HANA? Suite on HANA is basically exactly what you have in ECC on S4 HANA. I'm oh, sorry, on a HANA da database. Um, S4 HANA means your ECC system changes. It's, it's different. Functionality is different. The look and feel is different. Transactions are different. You know, you, you basically have migrated your data over to a different system, which is also an S4 HANA. You know, pre prerequisite to have um, S4 HANA Enterprise, the third option here, third box, is it needs to be on the HANA database, right? So in option one, you're saying, I'm not, you're not implementing new GL at all. You're just going from ECC to Suite on HANA to S4 HANA, and then later on, you'll activate new GL. So maybe two years down the line. I explain that a, a, a little in more detail later. So 
Option one says, I don't want new GL, I want to go on Espohana and I'll decide what to do. So companies in this book might think, you know, those two functional items that I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, we don't need it. You know, we want to go on Espohana because maybe, you know, the business, you know, Madman wants it that way or SAP has said, you know, we need to do it, but we, we just want to leave things the way they are. There's one thing to point out is that when you are an Espohana, not on Suite on HANA, when you're an Espohana, this enterprise management or Espohana enterprise management, you're automatically activated on new GL. Espohana is a new GL um, application, right? In fact, it, you shouldn't be calling it new GL. You should just call it um, GL. It's not been new. It's, it's been around since 2004, but we just can't get that uh, 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 terminology out of the system. And SAP has tried, but I don't know if it's worked. Um, so option two is you're on ECC with classic GL, then you move to Suite on HANA, so you change the database. Now, between the time you change the database and when you do go to s HANA, you do a new GL migration. So you do a new GL migration before s HANA, okay? And then you move to s HANA. The third option is if you're on ECC, the classic GL, then you do, you do a new GL migration. And then after you do the new GL migration, you go to Sweden HANA, then you're going to ask for HANA. Okay, so let's break this down in, in more detail. So option one, this is where you're transitioning to uh, Sweden HANA and um, ESPO HANA Enterprise, but you're going to subsequently activate new GL. So things to understand here is, is there any reason that you should want to go to new GL right now? So again, these are for companies that say, listen, parallel ledger, document splitting sounds well and good, but for our business, we don't need it, okay? Then um, if you are in that boat, then you've already determined that um, any function, functionality that new GL is providing, um, you can already resolve them either with your own kind of uh, functionality or some kind of uh, uh, business specific way that you do things. Like you might say, I, I don't need profit center but that fully to balance. You know, I can just use, I have a way to like group certain balance sheets into profit center, but I don't need the whole thing. Um, then, then when you make that determination, you need to not just make it for right now, you know, businesses change, you know, is there something your business is going to go through in the next couple of years? Maybe an acquisition, a new um, business line that is not going to be impeded if you don't have PGL. Okay. Benefits of this uh, approach is you have only one uh, um, you, only one project. So the, the suite on HANA is the only project you're going to do until you move to Espo HANA. Right, so um, you only have one project to do before you do Espohana, and you, it's only later that you do the new GL application, the uh, activation. You have when you implement new GL. Um, sometimes there are uh, there are some things you know fixes and things that you need to do. There's a reduced need to remediate your code for new GL. Because when you do your Espo HANA conversion, you will already have the Espo HANA um, 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 code remediation done then. So you wouldn't need to do it when you when you do new GL. That would already be done because you're doing new GL afterwards. Um, again, as part of that, you maybe your testing exercise will be different. And when you subsequently activate new GL at the end of this whole process, it'll be easier because you're activating new GL on basically SAP latest and greatest application, right? So there's less bugs in the system than you've activated new GL on the ECC, the classic GL, particularly if you've had it for several years. The disadvantage is, I think, pretty obvious. You know, you're waiting uh, several more years before you can take advantage of any of the um, new GL functionality. So the note here is one thing that could be confusing either to people hearing this or even people in this whole process is, you know, 
you know, you talk about new GL or activating new GL. Again, new GL is automatically activated with S4 HANA, right? It's automatically activated. It's the extra functionality, those two big pieces of documents put in parallel ledger, and there's one or two others like that, that you don't get. So on S4 HANA, you've got new GL, you just don't have that functionality. Okay? And that's what, when I say subsequent activation of new GL, I really mean subsequent activation of new GL functionality, because on S4, you will be on new GL. The second approach is where your ECC, the classic GL, you go into Sweden HANA, then you do a new GL migration, and then you um, go on S4 HANA Enterprise Management. And the benefits of this is that when you're on Sweden HANA, your database is much faster, and it really is much faster. So the downtime for new GL, which is, could be significant depending on the number and the amount of data you have, is, is significantly reduced. Um, so, and also since the database is already HANA during when you do the new GL um, project, you could have what's called the new GL HANA modeling capability. You have like a few modeling capability reports that you can utilize because you're on HANA. Um, and then also the finance users will be exposed to new functionality. So any chain management during the S4 HANA uh, conversion will be reduced. So if you decided like in the first option to let, to leave everything until you go to S4 HANA, you know, you might be getting so many things rushing at you at the same time. If you do it this way, you get some time to, you know, get familiar with the new GL functionality before you move to S4. A disadvantage is that you have two projects before your S4 HANA conversion, which will, will require additional development testing and downtime. And just a note here is that new GL migration should be at the beginning of the fiscal year for activation of these advanced functionality. And that's an important point, you know, that even though you, when you go to S, uh, when you go to S4 HANA, even though you can do that any, you know, you don't need to be at a year end. So if you're doing a new GL migration where you want to have documents, but you want to have parallel ledgers, it needs to be done over a year end. And I'll explain that further. The third option is Sweden HANA with, um, you go from ECC with classic GL to new GL migration within ECC. You go to Suite for HANA, and then you go to Enterprise Management. So this option is every customer, I mean, when New GL came out back in, in 2005, this is where any, anyone who's on New GL, who decided to go on New GL at that time or between that time and when HANA came out, that's the situation they're in. And I, I just as a guess, I, I'm guessing the not many people in that have this approach that are on this webcast right now because if, if you if you if you are already a new GL then you don't need to know about how to convert to new GL for S4 HANA you just need to know how to go to S4 HANA right so there might be some of you but I, I'm assuming that this is for these people they're already familiar with the new GL process and now it's just you know when do we move to HANA. So the benefits of this um, are the early adoption of new GL functionality for the finance users. Any custom functionalities in use that are not required after new GL don't need to be carried over. So that's saying that if, if you, when you go to new GL, you might find that some of your custom functionality, you don't need to do that anymore because new GL has, has, has satisfied some of those requirements. So, when so it almost cleans out your system even before you go to S4, which is sweet on hot. Finance users will be exposed to new functionality. So again, the chain management is reduced because you're getting familiar with this um, new GL functionality. This advantage is again is you know you have two projects before the S4 HANA conversion. The new GL downtime on ECC will the downtime you have in ACC will Will, will be longer 
because when you're on ECC, you're on the old database and it's not a HANA database. So when you go to the new GL, you know, you could go through all the, 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 the bottlenecks and obstacles that, um, you know, clients have experienced since new GL was introduced. And then the pseudo HANA migration will take a little longer since it has to migrate the new GL data. So I guess that's the offset. That's, that, that's another way of looking at that is that um, if you're migrating to Sweden HANA with new GL active, um, you know, you have these extra tables like Fidel Flex D and Fidel Flex A, and it, it could take longer when you're doing the Sweden HANA migration. So just to note that new GL migration is at the beginning of the fiscal year again, like I said, for these advanced um, uh, functionality. So the migration of classes to new GL, the process though is normally, you know, in the start of migration, you analyze the scenarios that you want to utilize. You upgrade to ECC 6.0, technical upgrade. You customize the new GL. You customize the settings for migration. You test the migration, and you actually do the migration when you end the project. Another thing that I've been asked several times that causes confusion is when you're doing a new GL migration, the difference between customizing for the migration and customizing for new GL functionality. These are two different things. The migration itself is a project on its own, just because it's it's taking certain types of data and doing things to them. Then separately, the functionality that you want to use for new GL is also something that needs to be configured, right? Think of the migration part as dealing with the past or taking past data and try to make it compatible with new GL. But the actual functionality for, that you need, like document in parallel uh, ledger, these are things that you need to configure and test from a business process standpoint so that everything works going forward. Right, the next couple of slides you've probably um, seen. If you, if you look at anything on new GL, you use these slides which have phase zero, phase one, phase two. Um, I'll talk about these because um, if you're going to new GL with, with the intent of using the new functionalities, it, it's, you still have to do this. You know, right now you still have to do these phases are still relevant, even whether you're on ECC or s because of the migration. So phase zero is when you're on classic GL and you're not on new GL yet. You, you haven't transferred any documents yet. And for accounts that, the way SAP does it is, first of all, the first milestone, if you want to call it that, is the migration date. And the second milestone is the activation date, right? Think of the migration date being at the end of the year, right? So if we're in, in August right now, you're going to do a new GL project. Your migration date will be um, the end of the year, so 12-31-2018. Uh, Your activation date will be sometime after that, maybe April 2019, right? So using those dates in mind for this year, what you'll do is um, well, there are certain things that will happen um, for every document that's posted this year. If an account is not managed on an open item basis, the balance, you only have a balance to carry forward for that, those lines in that account. If it is on the open item management basis, then you get the individual documents, right? In during phase zero, this is when you do the blue, blueprint. So like the, with the migration date of 1231, you do the blueprint, you analyze the current system. This is where you do all your business process analysis. Okay, what do we need to change? In phase one, the documents are completely posted subsequently in the migration. That means that everything from January 1st, 2019 going forward, even before you've actually 
um, move these documents over to new GL. Everything from January 19 going forward will be transferred exactly as it is, right? It's not going to be rolled out or summarized or just balanced carry forward. Every document goes over. And if it needs to be split, the document splitting will be split accordingly, right? So in phase one, what you do is make sure you close the old fiscal year, custom, do your customization of new GL. Um, and then at the end of phase one, you perform the migration. When phase two is now new GL is active, it's got the configured functions. And what, what you do is you start working within the new GL and at some point deactivate the, um, the, the, the settings for classic GL. Okay, this is another um, uh, this is another way of seeing the same slide with um, without document splitting. So without document splitting in phase zero, you test, you do all your testing for new GL. You start the migration cockpit, which kind of looks like a closing cockpit with different steps and different things you need to do. And then uh, an optional step is you could do some of the new GL customizing the production system without activating. You can activate new GL, but you can at least start, if you know that you want to use functional errors or things like that, you can have some things in there. And then in phase one, you want to complete the customizing, you want to kick off the migration project, and then you, you do the productive migration using the migration cockpit, including activated new GL. So one thing I want to mention here, it's another thing that causes confusion is um, when I see the migration date is 1231, right? And people think, oh, we have to migrate on 1231. That's not the case. You don't physically migrate anything on 1231. It's just a date. In fact, 1231, you could be, I don't know, celebrating New Year's Day or whatever. You don't even need to do anything there. That's a virtual date. That date is just a date you put in the system to say that any documents before this date, I only want to transfer balances if it's not open item managed, or I want to transfer individual lines if it's open item managed. Any documents after this date, I want to transfer everything. That date is virtual. The actual migration doesn't happen until about a couple of months later, right? The physical migration date happens a couple of months later. In fact, the physical migration date is the same as this activation date. So although this is how normal SAP slides show, really this one, this first one should say virtual migration date. The second one should say physical migration and activation date from UGL. Okay. So the next slide shows uh, SAP recommendations with documents. So it's, it's pretty much, um, the, the, the same thing, only remember with document splitting, what happens is that not only does the new GL migrate the document, it does something with the documents. You're not just moving data over from classic to new. When you get to new, you should have actually configured the system so that the system knows which documents it needs to split. Okay, so there's a lot more work done with document splitting. Right. In fact, with document splitting, even in phase zero, when I said in phase zero before, you don't need to do much with the migration cockpit in production. In phase zero with document splitting, you need to do what's called a document splitting validation in the production system. This is what's going to tell you if you're going to get any issues with document splitting. Um, then in phase one and two are pretty much the same thing. So again, just to summarize the three slides of this, um, this, this timeline, um, phase zero is, let's say it's from now till the end of the year. This is when you do your blueprinting. This is when you do, you know, you're testing the GL configuration in the sandbox, you don't test it in production. You complete any customizing that needs to be done in production, but don't activate new GL. And if you have document splitting, you want to validate document splitting in production. Then 1231 comes, like I said, don't do anything, right? In 1231, you're still maybe working through some of these processes. It's just a virtual date. Um, the new year comes, and what you're doing in the new year is you continue testing the migration. So you really just keep on testing in iterative cycles in the sandbox. And just making sure everything is, is working okay. 
but the system knows that any document that's posted in phase one is now going to be transferred whole, you know, in individual lines to MageGL. And then you have what's called the migration weekend, which is this second milestone, which I'm calling activation day. That's when you do the migration and the activation. And again, just to summarize, even though the slides show, normally show migration activation, really this second one is my physical migration activation. It all happens at once. In that weekend, you're migrating and you're going to check the box to activate new GL. And then phase two, you're on new GL. At some point, you determine when you want to turn things off. So the last couple of slides is just talking about key aspects that need to be taken care of before deciding to on new GL. So one is, do you want to go live with document splitting or not? Again, document splitting is huge. And in fact, that really is the key, key functionality of new GL. The second, the timing, the migration is divided into phases I showed. You have to consider the financial closing, the closing of the normal books in conjunction with that time. When you're designing the migration strategy, there's things that you need to take care of while you're doing that, so just be cautious of that. And if you're doing a new GL migration, as far as I, I, I know, I don't know if anything's changed, but um, you need to pay SAP for the migration cockpit and some services they provide. And, those, and there's a note there that explains that. You know, some of those services is, I know, first of all, you know, they send you a, a, a questionnaire you have to fill out, you know, when you want to go live, some, some minimum system details, who the project manager is going to be, whether you have an external consultant or you're using your own people, just basic information. Um, and then they, when they look through that uh, questionnaire, if everything's okay, they give you a key, a key to add to your system, and that system opens up this migration cockpit. The migration cockpit is a, is a logical structure that shows you all the steps you need to take. And then SAP also provides three um, um, service sessions. One is to validate um, Based on what you say you want in new GL, they look at, take a look at your system to see if um, everything is going to work out fine. They run a program through your system. If anything flags that's wrong, like normally if, if companies that use document summarization, if they want to use document splitting as well, that gets flagged because sometimes that causes issues. There might be some other things with changing the open airplane management uh, settings and new um, general ledger accounts. That could also cause some problems. So they, they'll flag all that for you and tell you to fix that. And they have another scenario that says, okay, when you've done one or two test cycles, they come in and validate those, those tests just to see if everything's going to be okay. And then also during your migration weekend, when you're doing this physical mig migration and activation, they, they're just on hand, 24-hour 20, support. I mean, I mean I, when I've done these projects, I've never, I've never had to actually use them, but you know, it definitely gives you peace of mind knowing that they are on call if you need them. The migration steps and tools available, um, you know, the migration creates a work list of all the items that are open and the documents. And also, like I said, if you're doing document splitting, any, if you want to enrich these documents, the profit center or segment, um, these are things that happen during the migration. The balance card forward um, is, is done, is met for all the general ledger accounts that are not open at manage, it kind of carves out which ones should be migrated individually versus just on a balance level. And it's, it activates these new tables when you have new GL instead of, uh, you know, GLT0, GLPCA, you have new tables that take all this data. And then um, it, sub it transfers these documents to new tables and when you, you end the migration and then you activate new GL. Okay, and the additional dimensions we're, we're talking about is like business areas, prop center segments, et cetera. And on, 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 on Espo HANA, you actually have other fields as well. You have, you have custom fields that you can add and use those as you know, document splitting dimensions. So things to note if you have um, companies with different fiscal years, you need different migration plans for those. So they should be migrated separately. 
you know, if you have one company with document splitting, one with without, they also have to have different migration plans. Migration cockpit is basically, if you've seen a material ledger cockpit or a costing run cockpit or a closing cockpit, it's pretty much the same thing. It's a little more elaborate, has more steps, but it's really just a whole bunch of sequences that you need to execute and it gives you results and you need to act on them before you move to the next step. Okay, um, so that was basically the, the uh, presentation in a nutshell, just to, to, to give a quick summary. You know, we looked at two big pieces of new GL, parallel, parallel ledger and document splitting. We looked at the, um, the different ways, uh, the different implications of migrating from classic GL to s hana different ways you could do that and the pros and cons of doing that. Then we looked at the migration of new GL itself and different phases of migrating to new GL and um, the consequences of, of, of doing certain things at diff different points in time on the new GL timeline. Um, so hopefully that was useful for people on the webcast. We have, um, I'm gonna hand it back to, to Maureen to, to, um, to see if there's any questions. And if we can't answer all the questions, sorry, I might have overrun a, a little bit. I will, what we normally do is just post your question anyway. We, we make sure we answer every single question and we send that to everybody who, who joined the webcast. So I'll hand it back to Maureen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Um, and as he mentioned, if we don't get to your question, since this will be a little bit of a shorter Q&A session, uh, please do ask and we'll make sure that Paul gets those questions so he can follow up with you accordingly. Um, but we'll get right into it. Uh, first question that came through, are extension ledgers used for local reporting for local statutory purposes? <laughs> I would say if you if you want to use a ledger for local statutory reporting, I would say use a parallel ledger. That's what it's for. You can use an extension ledger, but extension ledgers were brought out really for management reporting or management analysis purposes. Okay, so if you if this is for local reporting, that is a legal type of thing that's reported to a, a local region, I would say use parallel ledger instead. Thank you. Next question. If we have a new, if we have new GL and we have to move to S4 HANA, how, how do the migration, how should the migration steps be carried out? If you have new GL and you're moving to S4 HANA, you're now in the, you, you're pretty much in the same scenario as someone who doesn't have new GL and moved to, to S4 HANA. I mean, there, there's one or two things that are specific. Um, uh, maybe because of uh, uh, document splitting, but it's really much more of a typical S4 HANA migration that you're doing with new GL. Because if you think about it, any company that went live with SAP um, maybe after maybe 2005 and after was already on new GL. They don't even know they're on new GL, they're just an SAP. So if they were going to S4 HANA, it's just an S4 HANA migration. It's, there's not, um, in fact, you're in a better position if you have new GL and move into S4 HANA because S4 HANA is more compatible with new GL than the classic GL. So I think you're, you're ahead of the curve if you have new GL and you move into S4 HANA. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I'll hand it back to you just for any closing remarks. That is all the time that we have for Q&A. But we just get some questions in, so I'll be sure that you get those so you can follow up with everyone. Thank you very much, Maureen. Thanks to everyone for attending. Again, I hope it was useful. Um, if, you, if you have, like as Maureen said, any questions you have, if you've attended any of our webcasts, we make sure we answer everything. We post you the link to, to this webcast as well as the questions that we answer. If you have any information um, about if you need any information about ERP figures, the website is showing up there. If you have any specific questions that don't relate to this session, please feel free to email us at info at ERPfixers.com. So thank you very much, and thanks, Maureen, for, for hosting this. And I hope to see you at a, a webcast in, uh, in the next month or so. Thank you again, Paul, for a great webcast. On behalf of ASUG, I'd like to thank ERP Fixers, as well as all of you who took the time to attend this webcast. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, as we said, we will follow up with you post-webcast. 
But before we go, we'd like to leave you with some quick information on ASAC for anyone unfamiliar with our user group. ASAC helps connect SAP customers to the people and information that they need to maximize their investment in SAP. If you'd like to speak to someone about becoming a member of ASAP, please message info at ASAP.com. As mentioned before, the recording and slides from today's program will be posted to the ASAP website, and all registrants will receive a follow-up email. Please take a moment to complete the survey by clicking on the green button at the bottom of the screen. And with that, I will close today's webcast. Have a wonderful day, everyone.